Good morning, Millie. Um, we're, we're trying something new here, uh, where you and I get to just talk over video about a, essentially a reflection on 2019, but not just going through the news, but instead going through the things that we consumed, like yeah. the, the, the books, the, the movies, the TV shows, and um, I have a list, you have a list, yeah. some of them we've watched, uh, uh, we've both watched and we've both read, some we haven't, and just see what spoke to us so much around 2019 yeah. and what can take us into 2020. Now, um, for the people who are watching, um, I will warn that last night was the UK election. So we're all just a little bit tired and we're all equally trying to think about the things that we've seen and the things that we, we've read and try to imagine what the future looks like. So that's why this yeah, tech, tech exactly. conversation is so important. And, and if you don't have time to listen or watch the whole thing, there is a list in the show notes of the books, the podcasts, some YouTube videos and uh, from some of our colleagues some video games as well uh, that we can also add to. Um, but it, for me, getting your list was also uh, pretty useful to start my reading for December. All very different and some of them quite weird and not books that I would ever normally read. Um, but yeah, let's start, start with your, your first book, uh, which was Strangers in Their Own Land uh, by Arlie Russell Horschild. This one I haven't got around to reading yet, so you're going to have to tell me. Yeah, it, it's an incredibly timely one. It's in the same way that it was timely in 2016. So after the Trump election, so many people were trying to understand what had just happened because they were surprised. And I think there's an element of that going on in the UK today. So everybody's a little bit surprised by the, the strength of the response. And um, so back in 2016, this book was the resource that people looked to or in, in America. In America. Because he essentially tells the story of a, um, well, it, it's, it's a research-based book, so it's not a storytelling book, but it's, it's the experiences of a um, Californian academic, a Berkeley academic, who um, moved to Louisiana to, to conduct uh, research over an extended period of time of just getting to know people, trying to understand their stories and represent their stories and understand why they view, or first how they view the world and why they view it that way. Um, and um, yeah. It so was, did she start after the election, or it was before, and then everyone thought actually we should have. It was before, exactly. That's really good. Yeah, yeah, and so um, they, I think the version I read had a uh, an additional uh, chapter post election reflection. Okay. Um, but it was published before the election, and it just it just really it, it it's confounding, but also uh, so helpful just to see the world through other people's eyes where. Um, it's, it's not just their political attitudes, but it's, it's their uh, attitudes around the role of, of government, for instance. Um, a lot of the stories about people who lost their livelihood because of companies polluting um, in their own neighborhood, but equally they are uh, frustrated by federal regulation that would regulate these companies. Yeah. So it, it, just, it just opened your eyes to all these types of challenges when yeah. it comes to communication, discourse, regulation, and the variety of people. Yeah. And that the, the reasons why people make certain decisions are a lot more complex than we might Absolutely. narrow it down to. Because at, at PI, obviously, we've been looking at elections, we've been looking at the role of advertising, of micro-targeting. So does it go into the details of that and say, that is the reason, or that's part of the reason, or if you are able to really understand a community which you may be able to, through the data you gather, you can successfully target them because you'll know they're annoyed with this company that's in their vicinity and through that, or it doesn't, or you can take that and think about it. It's an excellent question. Um, so she doesn't address that in her book so much, but that links very tightly to one of the other books that I had on my list, which was, which was uh, Network Propaganda uh, by Yokai uh, Bankler um, and um, Hal, um, um, Hal, uh, Hal Roberts and Robert Ferris. And, they, this is a huge book, um, mm -hmm. and uh, size-wise, it took ages to read, but they, they question the role of social media in elections, okay. looking at the Trump election, um, and actually they take a, um, a very skeptical approach to the advertising question. Okay. Um, they, well, they take a skeptical approach to the fake news over social media question, yeah. because they say um, people who were consuming this were already of a certain political perspective. Um, and uh, while they are worried about the future where the platforms have so much power to shape what it is you see and what you consume 
including on advertising, they said that didn't affect the election per se. What they saw was um, online stories that were, were essentially fake, that were then picked up by mainstream media. And so it was essentially Fox News uh, was the root for so much of this on the right, and that's what they were most skeptical about. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they tear apart Fox News and its role as a result of this. So they're, they're quick to say, look, the Internet's not to blame. It's the fact that the Internet created all these crazy stories, and sometimes it was the Russians, sometimes it was other powers, but it was the role of mainstream media that corrupted the entire process yeah. or, or made it much more uh, loud. So, yeah, a bit of a mess. Yeah. Sounds like that one is more of an audiobook for me. Yeah, <laughs> a long audiobook. <laughs> if it's that size. Yeah. Um, uh, and so let's, what, I mean, I don't know which of the ones you think follow on naturally from talking about those two, well, um, uh, but the one that I read first from your list, well, I started on automating equality, then I accidentally started reading Bad Blood, uh -huh. and I, I just love that book. Um, so why don't we talk about that one? Yeah, next? sure. What, like, what, what got you into it? Um, well, at first I was reading Automating Equality and I thought this was a random chapter in the book. And, uh, and I think it's because it's the, the human story, but then so many people in it are so <laughs> distasteful. I couldn't believe that there were not really any characters that I felt sympathy or empathy towards. It just, I don't know a lot about Silicon Valley and how it operates. I've never lived there, I've never worked there, but it just seem quite toxic um, and what fascinate, fascinated me was the way a lot of the characters described how people believed in the woman who set up uh, Theranos, Elizabeth Holmes, without question and these were people who were super senior in the military and politics and they were just taken in by her charm and conviction and didn't question it and that felt extraordinary to me. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. It, it, I was I was enraged the entire time I was reading yeah. this because I could see how uh, this hero was constructed. We've cr constructed so many of these heroes. How often do we have CEOs of uh, of companies on the front cover of uh, magazines, mm -hmm. arms crossed, looking really authoritative, yeah. and thou shalt not question them. Yeah. It's uh, and this entire book is about how repeatedly they missed opportunities to question the claims and these are scientific claims these aren't just like one opinion versus another there's facts on the table that everybody just ignored even when there were whistleblowers mm -hmm. unbelievable and i think it was the the power of, of litigation as well which i think is equally a, quite a unique fascinating you thing in, that in america <laughs> that um that you can scare people to the point where this could not have even come out That's an and uh, and it was testing people's blood, which could have massive implications for their livelihood. Which the the, um, the author um, wrote about him, himself, John Carreyu, about people who had been affected this, who'd been misdiagnosed, um, who believed that they had serious health problems and it wasn't true. And then the doctors who suspected this, who when they went to the to the journalists, were then scared about speaking out it because of the threat, and because you can bully, even if you know you're right and that's that's also scary too it's a different way of um, how you can hide or undermine the truth in a way that is quite traditional really if you think about it um, I just thought it was it was just such a fascinating read and, and particularly because her um, Elizabeth Holmes's fascination with being the next Steve Jobs and that kind of individual who is just not bothered about the reality or the truth that just wants to be that that sort of icon it was it was quite weird to me not only do we create these heroes we create the aspiration to be one of these yeah. heroes where reality just doesn't have to exist in their yeah. minds which is terrifying yeah i found it very and then it, it was one of those books where afterwards you're then on like searching all about the case and what's happening and there's stuff coming on now um, so I think it, it it's one of those ones where you just want to know i just wanted to finish it cuz i wanted to know what happened yes. Um, and I'm not very good at waiting till the end, so I just have to read it really fast. Um, <laughs> That's what, what I was like with uh, automating inequality. No, really? um, this is, I read this essentially on a plane ride. I was flying to uh, DC to give a talk at um, the World Bank on some of these issues around data and inequality and surveillance. And um, I, I downloaded the book right before I got on the airplane yeah. and I couldn't put it down. 
Um, it was extraordinary. Now, you managed to put it down and get uh, distracted. Well, by accident, yeah. But maybe because it, it was just the right timing for me to read uh, Virginia Eubanks's book. But it just, again, tells these stories of people's lives being turned upside down mm. by the use of data through algorithms in, the, in this continuous war on welfare, on this continuous war on people in need. And so to make things much more efficient, um, governments and companies introduce all these systems that essentially just target and exclude yeah. people by design. And I think that feels um, as well, so what oh, I kept thinking about the Ken Loach film as soon because I just watched it um, and then I started reading this and you see how they set up the social security, the approach to people which is so encapsulated in that film and how it drives people away or can make you so furious or exclude people and it's it's essentially set up to exclude and it's it's something that I think perhaps was talked about has been talked about a while in terms of you know believing that technology is the answer and I think that's questioned a lot more but I think we still see that a lot in law enforcement and probably still in social services is they think well if we get the computer to automate it how can it be wrong? And it, I guess it, I mean, you know, I haven't finished the book yet, but I guess that's what it's really going into is that, and similar to something that we've, you know, read a while ago, the um, weapons of math destruction, is it's that same thing that don't believe in the tech, you have to question it, and yes, it can help, but, but it certainly can undermine the way things work. And it was also the way it showed how ridiculous it was. There used to be one person who called up, he said, things have gone wrong in my application, it gets sorted out. And then it's that frustration, which is again in the film, you call up, you get a different person every time, the person has no idea what you're talking about, you fax it in, you keep a copy of it, fax sounds quite funny, but I think they're still requiring that. And, uh, and it's lost, and then you have to go to court, and what a waste of everyone's time and money in a very expensive system that just doesn't function because it fails to understand how people function. Yeah, and is so many of the articles I've read that are critical of um say the Airbnb and Uber models have, compl have the same complaints. It's like once you start trying to question what's happened to you, once you want to lodge a complaint, then you're just sent in this black hole of, of people and systems that are always under-resourced anyways. It's yeah. almost like this is the intentional design of the future of bureaucracy, yeah. which is terrifying. That's, it, that is pretty much sums it up. And when we want to talk about bureaucracies, that's when we get to this book, I don't know if you've heard, heard of it, by this guy named uh, Edward Snowden. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, what was the name of that book again? <laughs> Permanent yeah. record. Did you get around to reading so that? So I started the beginning of it. So I've just li I actually have that as an audio book um, when I was doing a lot of walking earlier. Who was reading it? Uh, I think I, at the beginning, I think it was introduced by the same guy who does the audio book for Cryptonomicon. Oh no way! But now I think I can't remember. Okay. And now I just feel like it's him, so I can't even remember <laughs> if it is or isn't. <laughs> Um, but it, it's, it's very interesting um, listening to him and it, then when we'll get onto the podcast in a minute as well, it's like, it's the permanent record, isn't it? That's, it never leaves you. Um, and when he talks about his experience as a young, young guy experimenting on the internet and when he says, you know, you post these things on the for these forums and then people would say you're stupid, so you change your pseudonym and you'd then join in saying, yeah, who's this stupid person when it was actually you? And you wouldn't be judged against that because we all make mistakes when we're younger, we're all flawed. And I think, I'm, I can't remember exactly, he talks about how that helps you grow up and develop is to make mistakes and to say stupid things and for people to say you're wrong, you're right. Um, and then you to reflect on it a year later and he says when he looks back when he's trying to get um, his security clearance he thinks well what if they find those stupid things I posted which probably being the intelligence agencies they can but if you then think about it I don't know if he goes into it later in the book what if it's the insurance company what if it's someone checking you for a mortgage what if it's someone checking you uh, if they want you to do a flat share with them that's very, very different from the intelligence agencies checking that you can't be subject uh, to sort of bribery and corruption, yeah, yeah. and that you can't make mistakes as a ten-year-old, a twelve-year-old, a fifteen-year-old. What does that mean for the future of humanity? If that's the case, forever. And exactly. I think that's the really yeah. scary thing. So the the beauty of of the book, and of course we were always going to like it because we we love the work that he's done and. 
not just uh, him as a whistleblower, but him as a communicator. Mm. Uh, Ed Snowden's probably one of the best communicators Art Eagle has ever had. Um, the, it's essentially three books, and th there's the biography aspect that um, I also had a hard time putting down, uh, except I occasionally had to take breaks, particularly when he started talking about his own experiences with epilepsy. Um, it just, it just, you saw the human uh, yeah. Ed Snowden, which was just, um, yeah, it, it was, it was hard reading at that point. And, I, and of course there's, I don't know if you know, but he's a whistleblower, <laughs> he, he divulged uh, what we needed to know about the national security apparatus and the national security state. Um, and there's all that story, that compelling story about how he got the data out. So I'm and, not there yet, yeah. so I haven't. <laughs> it, it, it ends kind of happily. Um, but it's that first, it, it's that third um, story that he tells, which is he's, what you just described. It's, it's, uh, it, it's combined with his biography, but the whole idea that um, you have this permanent record and how terrifying it is to have this permanent record. I think that's probably the greatest contribution that the book has. Yeah. Of course, you get to know him, which is really nice as well. But and you get to read about the the, the, the narrative of his disclosures. But really, it's about his the commentary that he can offer about what's going on in the world and the direction of travel. He's almost uniquely capable of doing this, and he does it in such a remarkably smooth way. So mm. yeah, um, definitely find a time over the Christmas break where yeah. you have nothing to do because you, you're going to have a hard time putting it down. Yeah, those two hour slots. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, so there's a couple of other um, books we've got on here and I do, okay, the, one, the final one that I've started to read which is so far from what I would normally choose is Autonomous by Anna Lee Newitz. Um, that, when I, as, as soon as I started that book I, I just thought this is <laughs> so weird and not what I normally read but I'm getting into it um, and I can see how a lot of people like that kind of book but it is it's pretty niche yeah. or maybe well, maybe I'm not my maybe I'm too narrow in what uh, I read see, uh, <laughs> so it's, tell it's, me about it's what it's that, about like you'll absolutely get there so lately I've been reading a lot more uh, fiction um, and a lot more of uh, science fiction so that just that part of the brain can be fed. When, like, when you're reading the kind of books that we just described, you know, heavy. It, it's heavy and um, it's uh, a, a representation of the world as we have it. Whereas uh, reading fiction and particularly science fiction just helps you navigate the world as it's he as it's heading. And that's what Annalie Newitz does in her book. Mm. In that uh, she comes from our world. She uh, she's she founded IO9 or co-founded IO9. If I recall correctly, she used to be at EFF. And um, so, you know, she's as outraged around um, intellectual property rules as she is outraged about surveillance. Uh, she also wants to navigate uh, questions of humanity and automation. And this book does all of that in one, uh, yeah. one single narrative um, that essentially imagines a world where, um, yeah, in the future, uh, um, pharmaceutical companies can prevent you from knowing uh, what is in their medication and um, and they, they prevent you by law and they'll hunt you down with paramilitary forces yeah. and try to reverse engineer essentially what's in their, uh, their, um, their medication and their medication can make you very sick or can have undesirable outcomes mm -hmm. and it's a, an entire narrative around that there's a narrative around robotics and uh, the, the relationship between a human and a robot it's just it's just so many stories in one, yet equally it is of our world. And, yeah. and so, yeah, that was one of the better, um, yeah, one of the best stories I read this year that tried to be in our world. And another one, uh, which was a completely different approach, was uh, Sam Byers' um, Perfidious Albion, okay. uh, which is a very UK-based story, and it's timely for the kind of news we're dealing with today, where it imagines a Britain, um, and it, it's, it is our Britain, it's it, our day, but where there's privatization and welfare, there's privatization in, um, in, in social housing, there's political actors gone amok, and uh, it just crashed. Well, that certainly feels like I a know, book for today. Exactly. <laughs> I, I can't recommend this book enough in the sense that, uh, except that it is a little too much today, but it, it does give, um, 
guess a nice hero story. Okay. Within it, no, no. I mean, I would just going back to autonomous. I'm glad that it was on your list because now I feel I've got to persevere with it, and I think it will be really beneficial. But had someone say given it to me for Christmas, I read the first page. I'd have probably then, yeah. you know, sold it on eBay. No, I, I, I get it. But at, at the end <laughs> but of it, to challenge yourself with something, exactly. and then you know, it sounds like I wouldn't have necessarily wanted to dive straight into network propaganda. <laughs> yeah, indeed. indeed. <laughs> so, so, um, and then the other one you've got here, two more, is. Um, Making Evil and Lake of Heaven. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Making Evil is back in the, um, in the in the nonfiction section of of, of our library, and uh, this is a book I can't remember where I got the recommendation, but essentially, if you want to understand evil, you need to read this book, and and so it 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 essentially says there is no such thing as pure, unadulterated evil. That's a human construction. And you just think, okay, how could she possibly say that? Like, there's so many bad things in this world. There have been and there shall be. How can you not call that evil? And she has the guts to basically deal with every single one you can imagine. Wow. Uh, and, and just address the fact that it doesn't make sense to say that something is is evil just in its mm. own right. I mean, I've read the first couple of pages and it feels like one of those books where if you go out to the pub or with friends, you're suddenly going to be the really controversial one saying, well, you know, we've all read about this horrific things in the news. Are you sure you think like this? And it's like as if people don't already think, you know, you're a bit subversive. Anyway, you're now going to say, I don't think they're pure evil. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see how, if I finish that before Christmas, how that uh, creates some challenging conversations. Yeah. Oh, my gosh, around the dinner table. <laughs> Absolutely. You will finish it in a minute. It's, it's a short book, um, and it's one of those you just can't put down. Because like, yeah. after you've read a chapter about uh, um, uh, uh, about murderers, um, you see the next chapter, and it's even more compelling. It's like, I've got to get into that one yeah. next. Um, and so the last one, Lady of Heaven, I have, I have no idea what this one's about. This is an Ursula Le Guin book but from ages ago. It's a really old book. Um, but uh, she passed away, um, it might have been this year, or it might have been last year. Um, and so I've been trying to catch up with all all of her books as a result and this one was just it it was it, it's so much of our time in, in a sense but it imagines um this guy that whenever he falls asleep and dreams um whatever he dreams becomes part of the world when he wakes up oh, wow. and uh as a result he's terrified of falling asleep I mean, I think we all would be. Yeah, he's stealing drugs. He doesn't fall asleep, and he eventually gets caught, and uh, he eventually uh, gets treatment. But the person who's treating him realizes that this incredible power, wow. and starts trying to use this incredible power uh, to shape the world in his own interests. And it's just like I've always been fascinated with multiple universes and multiple timelines. And I can't believe I've never read this classic. It's yeah. just unbelievably good. That sounds awesome. Um, I, I put down a few books that I read which generally have nothing to do with privacy and surveillance. Good, good. We need um, our brains. Which can be the antidote. Yeah. Um, although they're not much of an antidote because they're all pretty harrowing. Um, but before we get to the harrowing ones, I just wanted to mention uh, Cryptonomicon, which oh. you and one of our um, former techies have both referred to when I first started at PI, so I thought, well, this is a book I must read. Uh, it's enormous. It was one I listened to um, uh, on audio rather than, than read, which almost was the most amazing pleasure, and I got my partner to listen to it too, oh, and really? we both still talk about it, and I love it. It's just, it sucks you in, um, in a way that sometimes doesn't happen when you're listening to audio, and often you only get when you're actually reading it, you feel you're, you're part of the story, but even listening to the audio on this one, you were, you were there with them. Um, yeah, just to get back, and this is Neil Stevenson's yeah. uh, book from, I think it was like 2000 or 2001, yeah. but it's, uh, it, it tells multiple story, well, the same story, multiple timelines, yeah. like around the, the uh, Second World War, around um, cracking the Enigma Code, um, and then around uh, modern times, uh, about the grandson and grandchildren of the, the major characters. And it, it's, it's about, if you wanted to put it in today's terms, it's about uh, uh, crypto yeah. coin, it's about governments and national security, um, it's about Silicon Valley. It, and I think you just see references, one of those books you see references coming up once you've read it. 
because there's quite like a, probably a growing community of people who've read it. And one of the weirdest things happened at the time I just finished it was I think it was GCHQ released a whole load of stuff, and in there the name Lawrence Waterhouse. And it was when they would, it was, there was a very famous author who had also been interviewed or something for GCHQ MI5. And then I saw Lawrence Waterhouse. No and I was way. like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and I can't find the tweet where I, where I identified it. So I've never been able to find it again. So maybe I was hallucinating. Oh. But um, yeah, uh, well, I just like, love that book. As a, as a proper geek, um, there are two books I go back to probably once every 18 months. And that's uh, Lord of the Rings and Cryptonomicon, oh, yeah. just because it's it's comfort reading, but it's also they are. Too. I really feel like that those are books to you just can't stop going back to. Um, and just very briefly on the other books that I've read, uh, so I read The Nickel Boys by Coulson Whitehead, which I, I think you started. started yeah. I couldn't put it down. I was so shocked, and I think it's really good to remind you that something that really was very recent um, and so horrific. Um, all about these boys um, who are sent, I mean I don't even know what you call it, it's like a reform school, or it's basically just a sadistic, horrific um, school for boys and, uh, and what happens to them. And based on um, real stories of, of what someone did, I think, the, I think it was maybe Coulson might have himself or someone else had found out happened in various schools in, in Florida or somewhere in America, um, so a lot of it is based on, on truth and I think it's always good to go back <laughs> and learn what happened in the past because certainly for me my my uh, historical knowledge even in recent history is not very good and it's good to remind ourselves that as human beings you know we've been very imperfect and um, doing some horrific things and quite recently uh, and so then there's another one that was um, I guess I don't think you could call it similar but in a way about a, a a young boy who was in the care system was Lem Sisse's My Name Is Why. Oh, I haven't heard of that Which one. is, it's very short, it's so powerful, and obviously we love subject access requests. He does a subject access request no for way. all his care records. It takes him years to get it. And then he writes the book about his memory of it and then what's written about him. Oh, wow. It's really, really fascinating. Um, and, and how he was treated and it's a, it's a beautiful book, um, and he's an amazing writer, he's a poet anyway, and, uh, and just how he went through the foster system. He was basically stolen from his mother, and then put in the foster system, and then rejected by his foster family, and then ended up in the care system, and just how he was treated, and how people wrote things about him, and I guess I haven't really extrapolated it to the, to the board what it would be like now. But again, it would be that permanent record, wouldn't it? And it would be way more permanent and accessible now that it's in digital form, whereas before it was all written. So I guess uh, it's, that's not something I've really thought about a lot, but how, what does that mean for kids in care now whose records are all online? What if the health service wants to get them? What if the home office wants to get them? What if they want to outsource to Google and Google wants to build AI on top of it? Well, yeah, that's a more disturbing conversation. Um, so I really recommend that. Oh, I'm putting that. Down and then I also read um, a much older book, Beloved by Toni Morrison, um, which was incredible. Um, and then Girl by Edna O'Brien, which was more about like the Chibok girls. And it was again a fascinating insight into an individual who that happens to and, and what the impact is in them and how we have to understand people who may be victims or people who we may believe um, become the sort of perpetrators of violence and, and I think that relates a lot I guess in the UK if we think about British citizens who are having their citizenship stripped to kids who have gone to certain countries and joined say Islamic State like how do we show humanity and try and understand uh, what's happened to them as well as obviously some people you know would need to go through the criminal justice system that that's not what happened in this case, obviously, but it's understanding the person behind it. And isn't that, I like, really like that. I, I, this wasn't at all planned in our conversation, but isn't that the theme throughout all of these books that we're yeah. finding so fascinating, which is that the hum finding the humanity, even when it's it's it might be something considered evil, yeah. uh, finding the humanity within the system or which the just inhumanity, gets lost. Yeah. exactly. And it's it's sort of removing ourselves from that. 
Um, and I think that's what's often quite frustrating when we see how government systems operate. Is It's like, think about just that individual who this is affecting. And it's, it's, and it's, it's with the, whether it's the application of technology or whether it's the application of bureaucracy, we're always trying to be dispassionate. It's like, but why? Yeah. You know, we have to remember there's a human behind yeah. all of these things. The human that we're trying to protect, the human we're trying to, to, to defend. Yeah. Why and I think that's, you know, the why almost Lem Sisse's book is so good is it just shows, like, this is what happened to me when I was treated like this. How do you think... What, you know, what do you think the impact is on on all those other kids yeah. who went through this and were treated like this? And so, at such a young age, had no one to hug them and love them. <laughs> and they were just like part of the system and tr almost treated in a way you would not treat an adult but judged so severely oh. for behaviour that, that, you know, I'm not an expert in that area, but that has a reason behind it. Tell me there's, there's, there's happier things that we've read or we've listened to. Maybe we should go to the podcast yeah. then. Oh, oh, I haven't yes. got, I'm, I'm starting on your book list, so I haven't got any more <laughs> positive books um, at the moment. Um, so uh, we've got two podcasts from you and then two that I put down. Cool. So I've listened to the John Ronson, The Butterfly Effect, which is was your choice. So um, tell me what you so, thought about that. Let me first be frank. Um, uh, I have, uh, I have a kid uh, a little older than your own, and so uh, I'm only now finding time to get into the whole podcast thing. I missed the, the podcast wave okay. uh, because I was just constantly uh, parenting uh, or just not sleeping, and so the whole idea of putting some, some, something in your ears and, um, and listening to it just would lead me to sleep with little sleep I had. And so I, um, I, I've been hearing about this podcast from uh, John Ronson called The Butterfly Effect for ages and I finally found the time to get around to it and um, it's about the porn industry uh, and how the porn industry has been affected by the rise of uh, uh, well, the online porn yeah. industry or essentially the aggregators like Pornhub and um, uh, um, I should know the names of the others but they're blanking right Red now. Red I think. Right, yeah. <laughs> and I'm not saying I should know the name of the other, I'm just saying I'm tired because of last night's election uh, and we're all in the office late watching. Um, uh, the election of uh, porn, um, but it was like the thing that really, apart from the destruction of the uh, porn, porn industry from the availability of free porn, one of the most interesting stories in there was also um, how once the data, once the the uh, online uh, porn aggregators started hiring data people, it changed the sector, yeah. um, and. I'm going to get the, the, the story wrong, but the, 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 the details wrong, but essentially once they start uh, analyzing what people viewed, they then started to dictate what kind of porn should be created, which dictated the kind of uh, uh, people who would be in the porn yeah. industry. And the titles of them. And the titles of them. And th this particularly affected, so apparently uh, people, um, very popular videos are, um, are of younger looking uh, women and uh, so what uh, what the actors are finding is that if you're 18 to 21 you'll do well in the industry but the moment you hit 22 or 23 you're no longer valued by the industry because mm. you don't look young you have to start looking old to look uh, to like appeal to, yeah to be the That's next when you get employed again exactly and it's like it's all because they did that data analysis that now that's affecting employment yeah. And also the absurd titles that have to come up with, like, cheerleader, stepdaughter, yeah. yeah. Um, my, uh, I mean, I find it fascinating because my immediate reaction was, like, why are you talking about porn? And this is something John Ronson says, like, he would speak to friends and they say, you have to show how bad it is. But he, um, he brought out the humanity of people who work in that industry and their stories, and it was it was so fascinating listening to them to them speak. Whatever you think about the porn industry, and uh, and I thought the other thing was um, again the permanent record. This guy who used to work in porn, he then trains to become a nurse, and none of his stuff used to be on Pornhub or any of the other ones that are easily accessible. And then suddenly it's all copied on there without him knowing. He's working in this hospital and suddenly people of all ages and backgrounds are looking at him and recognising him. And then he's called in and said, you can't be a nurse anymore because we know that you're on Pornhub. 
So anyone, and you see how young the people are who get into it, 18 or younger, um, hopefully not, um, that will stay with you forever because you have no control where that goes. And that's terrifying. If you do something when you're younger and you go into porn and then you're like, do you know what, I made a mistake or I've changed my mind or I want to do something different, I'm going to retrain, put a lot of time and effort into it. And then you just lose your job. And so then you, you can't escape it, but how are you ever meant to realise that when you're younger or you make that decision? Um, and almost in a, in a way that's much harder to challenge than if it's your social media, because you can delete your social media um, or you can challenge various things that are said about you online or ask for Google to delete them. But if it's on Pornhub, that's it. Um, there are also lots of other fascinating stories in there, um, but maybe I'll leave yeah, that for yeah, people yeah, to Yeah, we can go on for to. hours about this. Uh, <laughs> but that is, I thought it was a really good series and he presented it so well um, in a way that was very much letting people tell their stories. Yeah. Um, and then I got sucked into to listening to the subsequent series, um, The Last Days of August, oh, I, I which, is quite a, which is quite a counterbalance, so it does bring up a lot more of the critique of the porn industry, oh. um, but a different side to it, whereas that obviously wasn't necessarily his intention um, in, in the first series. But the first series is, is just brilliant. Um, so the other one um, that you recommended, and I've only actually listened to one, I've, I didn't know if I liked it that much, is Fortunately. Yeah. It's uh, it was the first, it was my gateway to the uh, the podcast world. Um, this is a uh, a series run by two BBC journalists. Um, they're always recording outside the uh, BBC headquarters in, in London, and the the, the premise is um, they also have guests, but they're having conversations with guests that aren't about the usual things that the guests would get asked. Yeah. Um, and so, and it, it's not necessarily a deep dive in their personal life either. It's just to have a conversation with somebody that you wouldn't normally have with yeah. that person. And it's just, it, 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 there's no privacy or surveillance angle to it. I just find that it's, in, in a way, celebrities and and political uh, political leaders and industry leaders, when they're interviewed, they have to um, show their persona. They have to be that leader. They have to be um, that that person that everybody wants to hear their soundbite from. But this podcast just takes a different approach yeah. because you're a human being. Let's, let's have a conversation. Yeah. And um, we don't always know what we think about things. Exactly. Sometimes we change our mind. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. So and, yeah. In, in a sense, it's it's what I, I want from this conversation. We have yeah. no idea where this conversation is going. Yeah. And we're, we're talking about things that, even though we sit across from each other in the office, we never have these conversations. Yeah. And that's, that's the virtue of this yeah. format. And, and it helps through the medium of things you read, because everyone will interpret something differently, or there'll be a story that sticks out for you. Um, for me, I the, like the recent podcast I listened to was The Missing Crypto Queen, which I don't know if you've had a chance to no, listen I to. Haven't which heard. almost, having discussed um, Bad Blood, is again building up that individual. Um, but in this one, and I haven't looked recently online to see what's happened to it, but it's, it's, it's almost so religious that even though it's been said by many people to be fraudulent and a pyramid scheme, people still believe in it. Um, but it's, it's that terrifying thing of people investing huge amounts of money in things they don't understand. Um, and believing that this is the way to be a millionaire. Um, and when she presents at various things, she really is, you know, they have this amazing music and she's presented as the person who will save them and it's challenging authority as well. So a lot of the narrative is, of course, people are going to criticise this, of course, they're going to say it's fake, of course, they're going to say you're not going to make your millions. And so because there's such bar into that, that's why people still believe it will come, come true. And, uh, and it, wow. it, it's just the forces that be, the existing banking infrastructure that refuses and resists being challenged. It's like, so we, we have to draw this conversation to a close now because uh, we've been going on for a while. But I'm, I'm genuinely surprised where this entire conversation has gone because like, I'm seeing the, uh, the, the themes coming out like, like, and that are so 2019 yeah. and so it's so 2020. Uh, unfortunately, as well, like it, it is the the construction of narratives and communities around narratives. Mm -hmm. Whether it is the podcast series you just mentioned, or where we started off with strangers in their own yeah. land, 
Um, it's the, 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 the treatment of humans and the reduction of their humanity by bureaucracies, um, whether it is uh, from automating inequality mm. uh, to Edward Snowden's yeah. uh, um, permanent record. It, that, this is why we like this yeah. stuff. And it's also, I think, I'm just going to finish on this podcast that I didn't put down, but it reminded me of it. So there's a podcast called Dissect that goes through albums, song by song. And so I listened to the one on Kanye West, and I always came from the view like, oh, he's such an idiot, um, not really knowing much about him. And this just, I mean, you know, it may not change your view on him, but changes your perspective on his, on the way he makes music. It's, it's so fascinating. Really? It's, and I listened to it, you know, when I was on maternity leave pushing the crown around. It was the best thing I've ever listened to, and I would happily listen to that whole series on Kanye West again. I love the album um, that they talk about because it takes you through how he made each bit, and this guy is a music expert, and, uh, and he doesn't necessarily like hip-hop when he starts doing it. So I think it is that, it's breaking things down, looking behind what our initial reaction is to people and challenging it. Yeah. Um, because we have to accept sometimes we get it wrong, sometimes maybe we need to sit on the fence a bit more and be less judgmental um, and perhaps that goes back to other stuff that John Ronson does Absolutely. as well about our, our immediate reaction on social media and what we see today which is very sad is people so divided that even if we disagree um, we have to find some yeah. common ground Maybe through reading one of the science fiction more, books. More, more likely, and you know, if 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 we actually manage to make this recording work, and we remember to plug in the uh, the microphone, and people actually are interested in, in this kind of conversation, maybe we can continue this along the lines of what people have watched, uh, yeah. whether it's movies or 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 um, streaming online. Where more people, uh, some of the people who are watching might actually have uh, have seen it too, and we can discuss these exact things coming out of that. Yeah, so we'll leave or a longer, yeah, a longer list of what we've watched, read, uh, in the notes, and it'd be great to get feedback, what people think, what they've been reading instead, um, and have another chat. <laughs> we yeah. can get through their list. Exactly, <laughs> I would love that. I would love that, and you've given me at least one podcast that I have to go off and listen to like as soon as possible. But I definitely want to uh, read on in the, the Nickel Boys, because uh, I just started it. Um, but also, um, the My Name is Why, that just sounds fascinating. Yes, I think it's one of my favorites of them. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you. Okay.